rockets forward of the starboard beam. Desde 46 executes turn 9 to avoid these flares and to get out of the cruiser line of fire. This was a break for Foote, who swings west to rejoin. The task force now being divided, the chance of embarrassing one of our groups has materialized. The Denver is forced to shear out of formation to avoid Foote, who is crossing to rejoin her division. Enemy fire is still short. Cruisers nearing maximum range come to course 230. Montpelier reports her target dead in the water. One destroyer steamed off at high speed to the north. It is believed that two ships of this group were severely damaged in the torpedo attack. A fourth target has appeared to the southwest. The northern enemy group is firing on Division 46, who is now clear of enemy illumination, but still in the cruiser line of fire. So the destroyers execute turn nine to the attack course. Thatcher turns too soon and collides with Spence. Thatcher suffers damage, but both ships are able to continue. Foote, still attempting to rejoin, receives a hit on the starboard quarter and is out of action. To clear Division 46 from the line of fire and to close the northern group, Cruiser Division comes to north. Eight-inch shell splashes now reveal the presence of heavy cruisers and explain why the enemy has been content to keep his distance and not close on us. No gun flashes are visible from the direction of the enemy. Denver and Cleveland shift fire to a target in the center group. A large explosion is seen on this target. The Columbia opened fire on a target in the southern group. Montpelier is effectively pounding the northern group. The leading cruiser changes course sharply to the right to avoid collision with a ship dead in the water. It is the foot who reports a torpedo hit in the steering engine room. She is completely disabled but can keep afloat. The torpedo either came from a submarine or the northern enemy group, in which case it was released before 0249 and ran a distance of 22,000 yards at approximately 36 knots. The torpedo salvo was probably directed at Division 46 on its first sortie to the west, and their fortunate retirement southward at 0253 carried them out of range, except for Foote, who stopped one. Apparently, the foot followed the rules set by all stragglers. All targets of the northern group are dead in the water. In order to close the center group and to cut off his approach toward our transports, the cruisers reversed course to the south. A thought constantly in the mind of task force commander and his staff was an attempt by one or more of the enemy units to make an end run into the waters of Empress Augusta Bay. At about this time, according to report of Comdesdale 45, two pips were noticed on the PPI scope that were in fairly good position to make a torpedo attack on our cruisers. And he could not understand how two Japs could have arrived in such a position so quickly. An IFF failure. Checking with Dyson, he learned that in the retirement, Division 45 had lost Stanley and Claxton. Luckily, he was able to locate and identify them as the two pips he had seen. At this time, he had two choices. First, to carry out his original intentions and head for the enemy with only two ships. Or second, delay until Stanley and Claxton could rejoin. He chose the latter, swung right and headed south so the returning ships could reverse and reach their original stations. So far, the cruisers were faring well. The enemy had not registered a single hit, though his fire had been very heavy. However, at this time, the enemy star shell illumination became most effective. A string of brilliant flares appeared ahead on the disengaged port bow. Course was changed 30 degrees to the left to put them on the starboard bow and escape being silhouetted. Resumed course 180 with the flares between the cruisers and the enemy battle line. 
This did not interfere with our radar-controlled firing, but definitely slowed up the enemy fire. Counter-illumination was ordered, with star shells short of the enemy. An excellent procedure against an enemy using optical observation. Flares from enemy planes now augmented the illumination. Even the familiar red stars were released, indicating to the Japs that our formation was made up of cruisers. According to report of Comdes Dear 45, this illumination was the most brilliant any of us had ever seen. They appeared to be stars properly placed to silhouette the cruisers. They descended at a much slower rate than any we had used. These stars served our force as well as the Japs, in that it helped the attacking destroyers to check the location of our cruisers. Destroyer Division 46 is closing rapidly on the central enemy ships while being fired upon by the northern group. Spence receives a hit at the water line, permitting salt water to enter a fuel tank. At this point, CIC on Spence reported the center group on which they had been closing to be friendly. With no time to investigate, the division commander immediately swings his ship and heads for the northern group which is firing on him. Division 46 has had four distressing mishaps in quick succession before firing a shot. A ship wandered from formation. A ship torpedoed and out of action. A collision and a shell hit. This, coupled with the confusion occasioned by radical changes of course at high speed, had very likely disoriented CIC. Because of poor identification, a golden opportunity was lost. On the Montpelier, pips indicating Division 46 merged with those of the center enemy group. From this time on, there was doubt as to the identity of ships near this bearing. Too much emphasis cannot be paid to the efficient operation of the IFF system and dispersed groups informing OTC of their location. During the next 10 minutes, the enemy illumination steadily improved, as did his shooting. The three leading cruisers were straddled in range, salvo after salvo. Most of these salvos were a matter of feet to the right, so close that the ships were running through the splashes and probably creating the impression in the alleged minds of the nips that they were on in deflection. These salvos averaged in pattern from one to two hundred yards. One salvo landed less than a hundred yards ahead of the Montpelier but most of those fired at her were overs. Between 0320 and 25, Denver received three eight-inch hits. She was straddled in range and deflection by five successive salvos and was forced to turn out of formation, although she continued to fire at increased range. Turn two was executed to throw off the enemy's fire control though all ships were zigzagging independently for the same purpose. As for our gunfire, it was superb. Our ships were hitting continuously, a fact most evident on an extremely dark night. The results obtained by our gun batteries under full radar control has been most gratifying. Frequent offset practices for ballistic corrections at long ranges pay dividends. Cruiser Division is ordered to make smoke, both chemical and funnel. The effectiveness of the enemy's fire fell off at once, while our own continued at a high rate. It was obvious from the many shell bursts seen on his ships to the south 
that the enemy was taking terrific punishment. Four large explosions were observed, and one ship was reported to have blown up completely. At this time, the rain had ceased, but a heavy bank of clouds hung over the formation at about 1,500 feet. As the enemy's brilliant star shells broke through, the ceiling of clouds acted as a reflector and enhanced the intensity of the illumination. The effect of the smoke was to fill this space completely. Division 46 approached the three remaining ships of the northern group. One, a cruiser, was disabled and steaming slowly in circles. The other two were retiring to the northwest. The fourth ship of this group, a destroyer, had sunk as a result of torpedo and gun hits. At a range of 6,000 yards, Division 46 fired eight torpedoes at the cruiser and took up pursuit of the two destroyers retiring to the northwest. At about the time torpedoes should have arrived at the target, two underwater explosions were felt by personnel in CIC on the Spence, but topsides reported that no flashes were seen. Division 45 is also closing on the crippled cruiser and is tracking contacts believed to be enemy ships retiring to the northwest. At 0349, they opened up on the cruiser and hit it consistently at 7,000 yards for one and a half minutes, but continued their chase after the fleeing ships. It is evident that Division 45 was chasing Division 46. Due to inoperative condition of IFF on the destroyers, much valuable time was wasted at a critical period and created the possibility of firing at our own ships. It is regretted that both destroyer divisions attack the same enemy group. Otherwise, enemy losses might have been greater. However, neither of the commanders knew that both divisions had concentrated on the northern group until the composite track chart was constructed two weeks after the battle. At 0344, our cruisers had stopped making smoke as all enemy ships were retiring. Montpelier attempted to illuminate her cripple of the southern group with star shells, but the illumination was not effective. More effective star shells are in production. A greatly improved performance can be expected with a recent modification. Montpelier ceases firing on her target, which is dead in the water. The ship is believed to be a destroyer. The cruisers came to course 240 to close this cripple, which is smoking heavily. The pip shortly thereafter disappears from the screen. He may have sunk, but could have been another contact picked up later a few miles to the west and reported by Columbia to have exploded. Cruisers come to course north. These radical changes of course are intended to frustrate torpedo fire from enemy cripples. To the everlasting credit of the cruiser captains, during more than an hour of violent maneuvering, amidst deafening din of battle, once was the formation in any way confused nor disrupted. At 0352, destroyer division 46 having closed the enemy to 3,000 yards, changes course to the left and fires 19 torpedoes. About two minutes later, two explosions are felt and a single column of black smoke rose from the target group. Again, no flashes of explosions were noted. The division opened to 7,000 yards and changed course to the west to cross the enemy T from astern, and at 0358, opened fire. Spencer's first salvo was seen to go over on the radar screen, but second and subsequent salvos appeared to land in the center of target. At 0401, Bridge reported two targets being hit and on fire. At 0403, Division 45 sighted this gunfire to port and shortly afterwards picked up Spencer's report that she was engaging two targets. Division 45 was chasing a target 
that must have been making about 38 knots, but lost it by 0407 when it disappeared over the horizon. At 0410, Spence lost suction and fell out of column. Salt water in the fuel was causing her to smoke badly. At this time, one ship was tracked pulling out at good speed to the northwest. Converse and Thatcher engaged this target. It slowed to seven knots as many hits were made and a flare-up observed. Division 45, now coming in, spotted a ship ahead which was smoking badly and being unable to identify, reported over TBS that they were going to open up on it. Spence, also smoking from loss of suction, replied, don't do it, that's us. Consequently, Desdiv 45 passed up this target, which later received the attention of Converse and Thatcher. At this time, it is not clear how Thatcher and Converse escaped being fired upon by Desdiv 45. 